Welcome everybody to another round of the colloquium and thanks you all so much for being here. I know that many of you are also on Zoom. Um, that's great. Thanks for joining us today, despite all the rain and wind outside. Um, so I'm Katarina Reinecke. I di direct the Wild Lab here at the, in the Ellen School. Um, and the Wild Lab usually does research around kind of barriers that prevent people from getting access to technology or to information in general. And one of the kind of parts of our research um, has been revolving around scientific communication. So science communication in the sense of, you know, how can we improve the science communication so that people are able to um, get access to it better, understand it better. Um, this is something that Tal August is going to present on. Then another strand has been on, um, you know, how can we actually enable researchers to better communicate scientific information? And how can we also enable them to um, improve their experimental practices, so how they, how rigorous they uh, structure their experiments and and pre-plan them and so on. And this is something that um, later Spencer and Rock will present on. So I'll let uh, Tal August get started. Um, Tal will present. He is a. You're going to talk about what well, I am. You yeah. you, are, you can introduce <laughs> yourself, but yeah, basically, <laughs> um, Tal is co-advised by Noah Smith. Um, so his work is at the intersection of NLP and HCI, and he's going to talk about some of his newer research on uh, trying to address these communication barriers online and science communication. Great. So Thank you, away. Katerina. Uh, so hi, everyone. As Katerina said, my name is Tal August. I'm a fifth-year PhD student working with Katerina and Noah Smith, and today I'll be talking about two projects on automatically addressing communication barriers in the context of science communication. I'd also like to say this is the first time I've presented in person in like two to, yeah, around two years, so bear with me. I don't know exactly what to do with my hands right now. Okay, so I wanna start by giving a quick example that kind of motivates this work. Uh, I'm gonna give you two sentences that report on the same information. So this is the first sentence. The use of dexamethasone resulted in lower 28-day mortality among those receiving invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen but not among those receiving no respiratory support. So to some of you, this might be totally clear, but to others, like myself, this sentence leaves me with lots of questions that keep me from finding the information very useful. For example, what is dexamethasone? Why use 28-day mortality? And what is considered no respiratory support? So here's the second sentence. The decades-old steroid dexamethasone turned out to reduce death rates among severely ill patients on ventilators by more than 12%. So for those of us who had trouble with the first sentence, many of our questions are now answered. At the same time, for those of you who might have made sense of that first sentence, this second sentence might have not helped clarify that much and indeed actually removed information that you found useful. So language is how we communicate and learn from one another. But if it doesn't address the knowledge or expectations of its readers, it can instead confuse, confuse and lead to misunderstandings. Take the past two examples. For some of us, that first sentence could have made a lot of sense. But to others, it might have been completely confusing. As more language moves online, writers of everything from articles to tweets are faced with larger and more diverse audiences, making it increasingly difficult to address the background of all these readers at the same time. Now, traditionally, people could assess how well their language was understood or received by having readers provide feedback on drafts. But this is unrealistic and doesn't scale for every tweet or blog post someone might wish to write. Now, one answer to addressing issues in language that doesn't scale is natural language processing, or NLP. NLP offers models that can classify writing, predict reader reactions, and adapt text automatically. Now, while promising, most state-of-the-art NLP models perform well on narrowly defined tasks, but suffer substantial performance losses when adapted to real-world data or more open-ended tasks. Now, in my work, I focus on addressing real-world communication barriers automatically by adapting and developing NLP methods. My past work has explored how language can influence user behavior in online experiments, in security and privacy interfaces, and in the subreddit R Science. And these projects have shown that good communication is person-specific. I'm now focusing in the context of science communication, and I'll talk about two projects related to that work here. The first is on automatically identifying writing strategies expert science writers use to overcome communication barriers. And the second is developing a tool to automatically apply one of those strategies, defining unfamiliar terms, to help adapt language on the fly to a wider range of readers. 
Now, before I jump into these two projects, I want to give just a quick overview of what science communication is, since that's kind of a context of communication I'll be talking about here. Science communication is sharing and explaining scientific findings to the general public. Its goal is to increase public awareness, enjoyment, and understanding about science. So that today I'll be focusing on science communication through reporting on new scientific papers, but there is lots of other types of science communication. Now, writing about scientific findings in a widely accessible way is difficult, as it involves explaining complex ideas and theories without overwhelming or confusing your audience. Now, to help with this daunting task, there are lots of style guides and handbooks and academic papers on the theory of science communication. Yet these guides usually only offer general rules for science communication, like know your audience or don't use jargon. And while helpful, these rules rarely have empirical evidence for how they're used or proven effective in practice. Our goal for this first project was to define quantifiable strategies driven by science communication theory and classify strategy use in real world science news writing. These strategies could then be used as a first step to support writers in adapting language to specific readers, adapting text automatically for a reader, or even identify when science rhetoric is used to persuade rather than to inform. We started by compiling a set of science communication writing strategies from a wide range of science writing guides in English. These guides were collected based on conversations with three science communication professionals and included blog posts, journal articles, and handbooks. We open-coded the guidelines in these resources and grouped them into distinct strategies. I'm not gonna go over all of the strategies here, I'll just focus on one, which is impact. And impact is writing about the real-world impact of the science or findings being reported in order to excite readers. Because our goal was to see evidence of these strategies in real-world science communication, we then collected science news articles from the Internet Archive, annotated a subset of this corpus with our strategies, and then trained classifiers to automatically identify if sentences were using a particular strategy. Given these strategy classifiers and data set, I'll go over one of the analyses uh, in our paper that was based on our expectations about the communication goals of one of the science news venues in our data set, which is press releases. We hypothesize that press releases will use higher impact than other venues because one of the goals of press releases is to encourage other science writers to pick up a story. And a key component for selecting science news stories are impactful findings. We found this was the case. So this is a little bit of a weird figure, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, this figure plots on the x-axis the number of sentences in an article in an article classified as the impact strategy. And on the y-axis is the proportion of articles containing that number of predicted sentences. So if you look at five on the x-axis and 0 0.05 on the y-axis, where they meet would indicate that 5% of all the articles for a particular venue had an estimated five classified impact strategies per article, impact strategy sentences per article. So the bolded lines in this graph are the press release sites we evaluated. So places like news.harvard or news.northwestern. And as you can see, these sites have larger modes compared to the other sites, showing that their articles had more predicted impact strategy sentences. So to make this a little bit more clear, where the arrow points shows that around 25% of the Rochester articles, which was one of the press release sites we analyzed, had an estimated two or three sentences classified as the impact strategy per article. Notice how many of the unbolded lines instead have their peaks closer to one estimated impact strategy per article. What's interesting about this is that the press releases used less of some of the other strategies that we looked at, like storytelling or avoiding jargon. And so this suggests that different venues use these strategies differently depending on who their audience is. Now, being able to automatically identify these strategies is great, but many of the documents we analyzed were professionally written for general audience readers. And not every journal paper is covered by popular media, and as more scientific information is shared informally over the internet and social media, as Spencer will talk about later, readers are exposed to more language that wasn't written for them in mind. Now, if we could automatically apply the writing strategies we identified previously, that could help adapt language on the fly to a wider range of readers. So in our next project, which is ongoing work, we do that with one of the writing strategies, which is defining complex scientific terms. Our goal for this project is to build an NLP model that can generate definitions automatically. But different readers have different background knowledge that can impact what sorts of definitions they'll understand. So taking a one-size-fits-all approach to these definitions could leave out many readers. 
To address this, our second goal for the project is to generate definitions with varying complexity to make definitions flexible to readers with different background knowledge. So I'm gonna skip a lot of the details on how we built this system for generating definitions, uh, but here's just an example of the system's generation for the term surfactants with low and high complexity. So you know, for low complexity, the term surfactants is a substance that dissolves water in a liquid or solute, and for high complexity, it's a molecule that binds to a hydrophobic surface. Now one thing you might notice about these definitions is that even the low complexity definition is still fairly complex. And we suspect this has to do with how we modeled complexity, uh, which was training on science news articles. This is still not super low complexity, as science news articles still do contain some jargon. So we're interested in exploring other ways of reducing the complexity of these definitions. Another issue is that NLP models are prone to hallucinate or make up information when generating text. And this can produce fluent but factually incorrect information that could risk confusing or misleading readers. So we're also looking at how to kind of encourage factuality or enforce factuality within these definitions. Now given these definitions, this definition model, I plan to build a reader tool that offers just-in-time definitions for unfamiliar terms during discussions on, of scientific findings on forums like the subreddit R Science. So for example, given a post and comment thread for a scientific topic on R Science, we could provide an automatically generated glossary of scientific terms or a bot that a user can interact with to provide definitions at a level of complexity defined by them. So that is it. Thank you very much. I am happy to take questions now, I think. Yeah, questions. Yeah, I was briefly going to say I'm going to monitor the chat as well. So if anybody wants to post questions in the chat, I can read them out. And then otherwise, we can also pass around the microphone here if anybody has questions. So what's the difference between using a dictionary or a Wikipedia and like, for example, the glossary in the R science you just uh, mentioned? Yeah, so I, I, there are two major differences. One is coverage and one is flexibility. So for coverage, like these dictionaries don't necessarily have definitions for all scientific terms that you might come across in a paper, since a lot of terms can be defined within a paper uh, or are, don't necessarily make their way into like a general purpose dictionary. So that's one is like being able to have a model that could be flexible to those terms. The other is that def dictionaries also provide a single definition at a single level of complexity that might or might not be understandable to the person uh, that wants that definition. So we often found when we looked at dictionaries for biomedical terms or scientific terms, the dictionary definition assumes that you are an expert in that field often, and the usage, like they use a lot of jargon in those definitions, so they're not necessarily that accessible to someone who might not know what the original word was. I was wondering how you decided on the levels of complexity. As you mentioned, this most likely depends on a group of potential readers. Yeah, that's a great question. So right now, we kind of have it at uh, just two levels complexity, high versus low, to kind of make sure that we can even do this. But the idea is that eventually, uh, this could be more of a continuum or a knob that a user could turn to kind of set for their own preference, depending on what they're reading. Yeah, the, the goal is to get it there. Right now, we're just making sure that we can even vary along two, uh, two categories of complexity. OK, there are also some questions in the chat. I'm going to read them out. Okay. So Michelle Lin asks, were there any cases where you found that one term had multiple definitions? How did you deal with these situations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there were, we haven't like deployed any of this, so it's not necessarily, this was more our experience while we were looking at terms and definitions. And in general, um, one thing that I didn't get into and in, like how we generated the definitions is that we also uh, provided kind of supporting information to the models for generating the definition. And these supported, the supporting information were uh, scientific journal abstracts. So usually if a term had multiple definitions, it would either be multiple definitions where in a scientific discipline, it has one definition, and in general usage, it has a different definition. So an example of this is like transformers in NLP means something very specific, but transformer in kind of general usage means something entirely different. In those cases, because we are drawing from scientific journal abstracts, we usually just got the scientific definition. In the cases where it's two different scientific definitions across different disciplines, uh, while we didn't address this it so far, uh, you could address this by basically filtering what domain of text you're drawing from or what scientific domain 
you're drawing from for those journal abstracts. Yeah, so that's, that, that's how we address it or could address it in those two different cases. Okay, the questions are getting harder now. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Jasper O'Leary says, nice talk tell. I'm still curious what the purpose of classifying sentences by usage, for example, impact jargon is for generating tailored definitions. Like how do sentence classifications matter for designing your future tool? Wait, say that last part again. How, uh, sorry, just jumped. How do sentence classifications matter for designing your future tool? Great, so great question, Jasper. I, there are kind of two different answers to this. One is that uh, the, the different strategies were more like a roadmap to show what are the important things that science communicators do to make language more accessible or to make this information more accessible. We kind of used it as a way of saying, okay, these are things that we could try and tackle automatically or not. And so I didn't get into the strategy. One of the core strategies from that first project was you should either avoid or explain all the scientific jargon that you're using. So that kind of informed the idea of even building a model that provided these definitions automatically. So that was kind of the first way is that it, we weren't necessarily using the strategy classifiers to say, oh, this definitional sentence focuses on impact or this definitional sentence focuses on storytelling. It was more that one of the core strategies was defining things. And so we tried to implement something that could do that automatically. The second part is that there are other strategies that would be useful uh, in other ways to translate scientific information to uh, these communities. Like an impact sentence, we could use the impact strategy classifier to, uh, kind of just lost my train of thought, but we could use the impact sentence, we could use the impact sentence strategy classifier to basically tailor how we generate definitions to be more in line with what someone wants. So if a user says, well, I really wanna know most about the impact of this work, if we tried to generate, let's say, a summary of an article for them, we could focus more on impact by using that strategy classifier. So that's like an alternative way that we could use these classifiers in kind of adapting language to different readers. Great, thank you. Um, okay, another question from Samuel Road is, um, have you considered using grade level as a knob for vocabulary? Have we considered using grade level as a knob for vocabulary? Um, sort of. I think that we mostly were looking at, well, I, I'm, kind of, I'm a little bit curious. Does he mean like for, I, I'm, I hope that he can respond to this, yeah. Um. Uh, uh, my interpretation would be um, in, instead of just enabling the users to turn the knob to, to change the context, just doing it based on their education level. Oh, okay. Uh, Is that, I hope, I don't know. He can, he can interrupt, he can text it or write it and say otherwise. Um, he says it, yes, something to that effect. Okay, okay, yeah. great. Um, I think that we, so how I talk about uh, background knowledge in the talk and also with complexity levels, I, I kind of uh, force it into like the single dimension of there's high complexity and low complexity. But in reality, you know, you might have background knowledge, you might have taken some biomedical courses in college, but you might have taken no physics courses, right? And so there's a difference in just the amount of background that you have versus what sorts of words you might understand and what sorts of words you don't understand. And in an ideal world, we could automatically adapt, we could have a reader profile for you, we could automatically adapt definitions or generations to kind of suit not just your education level, but really like the words that we know that you know versus the words that you don't know. In the case where that's not possible, I've opted more for kind of allowing the user to decide what they're comfortable with depending on the definition. So I think, yes, using their education level could be a good baseline to say, okay, we're gonna start there and see how you like it. But I'm more in favor of kind of providing that power to the user to be able to decide, I want definitions that are more or less complex because I'm reading something that I might feel more or less confident in that isn't reflected in my education level. But yes, I think it's a great, it's a great place to start uh, for tuning complexity. Yeah, so um, I think there are no more questions um, and I'm, I'm guessing Tal has <laughs> otherwise lots more to talk about if you ask him later on, but um, yeah, happy to. let's thank Tal for his talk. Let me just... <laughs> It's but so wonderful. Spencer has been doing a lot of work on um, scientific communication from the side of how do we enable researchers to actually communicate better. Um, he's focused on HCI for a long time, but right now we are also focusing on um, trying to uh, provide researchers with um, ways to communicate scientific information about the COVID vaccine. 
This is funded by the Vaccine Confidence Grant, and um, I'll let him talk about his tool, Ripple, that, um, that talks a little bit, or that, that, that addresses a little bit of that problem uh, first about communicating our scientific information to other people out there. Um, so yeah, Spencer, take it away. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I honestly wasn't listening to what Katarina said because I was busy with this, but I assume she introduced, this introduced me okay. Um, but yeah, so this is some work I do with uh, Katarina, obviously, as well as uh, my co-advisor, Gary, and um, Carrie and Carol Lay, all in uh, HCDE. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just get started. Um, so first of all, thanks to Tal for providing a kind of like definition of science communication. I won't be providing one in this talk, but it'll be very useful context. Um, so, um, but I'm gonna be talking about science communication and public scholarship specifically through Twitter, right? So Twitter has become like a really important platform uh, for scientists to share their research uh, with you know other researchers, with um, specific like practitioners and other stakeholder groups, as well as just like the broader kind of interested public. Uh, right, and researchers can use Twitter to reach really kind of like diverse, non-expert audiences uh, to kind of talk about like their their research. Uh, now, of course, as um, Tal maybe it mentioned, I can't remember. <laughs> good science communication really relies on knowing your audience very well. Yes, I do remember that in your slide, so you should be well aware of this by now. Um, but the problem is a lot of researchers um, on Twitter don't really know who their audience is, right? And this is a big problem with platforms like that because of the way, you know, affordances like retweets work and things like that. It's not really clear who your tweets are kind of like reaching out to. If you have a lot of followers, it may not really be clear like who those people are after a while. It's very easy to kind of like lose track. Um, and so the kind of like question we really tried to solve here is like how, how could researchers frame their work effectively uh, without this knowledge, right? Um, and, and the thing is like they, they can't, I think. <laughs> and so uh, our solution here was to build Ripple, which is a tool um, that automatically sorts Twitter users into researchers, practitioners, and other categories. Uh, it can display the average size and makeup of uh, a person's total like audience on Twitter. Uh, and that includes both like their immediate followers, as well as like all of the people who their tweets might reach kind of like downstream, like through the retweet chain uh, to get a sense of like what your total exposure on Twitter looks like. Uh, it also provides qualitative information about uh, how those people on Twitter uh, describe themselves uh, using keywords from their bio and highlights trending hashtags and tweets kind of like among those specific audiences to get a sense of like what they're talking about and what they care about. Uh, and the primary goal of this tool was to help researchers learn more about their audience uh, in order for them to frame their like research uh, more effectively and kind of like provide information that's useful to those specific audiences. Uh, and so to kind of like provide an overview of what our process looks like, uh, we started by building like a classifier to take uh, Twitter users' bios in order to like um, sort them into sort of like classes relevant to um, HCI research. We developed a prototype um, based on that model, uh, conducted an iterative user study um, using that prototype to understand like uh, whether it was like useful and what uh, HCI researchers' additional needs are, iterated on the model to come up with the final design, uh, and then ran an evaluation of that. Um, and we have yet to deploy the final system. Uh, so first, uh, to talk a little bit about our model of kind of like HCI relevant publics, um, to sort of like collect data, uh, we randomly sampled one paper from each session uh, at CHI 2019, uh, which for those who don't know, CHI uh, is you know, the, the largest um, HCI conference um, in the world. Um, and kind of like sampling from this, we ended up with like a set of about 744 unique uh, authors, about which like 50% of those had Twitter accounts. We then collected data about all of their followers, all the users exposed to their tweets like downstream. Uh, and so we ended up with a corpus of about like 11 or 12 million users. Um, we then uh, conducted like of the group of research assistants, like an iterative open coding process uh, to identify like what kind of like professional groups potentially relative to HCI science communication sort of exist among this like broad corpus of people. Uh, and then we ended up using like a semi-supervised topic modeling approach kind of off the shelf uh, using Corex. Uh, and so the four main groups that we kind of identified here were um, researchers, right? So uh, people in this group tended to use keywords like prof, science, research, PhD in their bios. 
uh, designers, right? So people who ended up using like design, UX, interface, like things like that. Software engineers, and these are people who use keywords like developer, software, code. Uh, and then everyone else who just kind of like clustered into this sort of like other publics group, right? People who don't fall into like one of these like large three categories um, that were like very prevalent um, in the sort of like HCI data that we collected. Uh, we then used that to build a prototype um, and conducted like a user study on that. Uh, I won't go into too much detail uh, into the prototype in the interest of time, but essentially the idea here was to provide some like high level information about uh, who their um, kind of like tweets were reading, reaching both within their like followers as well as their downstream audience, and a little bit of like high level data about their kind of like tweeting behavior. So uh, we ran this with uh, seven HCI researchers, randomly sampled from that like set of Kai researchers I mentioned earlier. Uh, this took about like an hour, and in general, we um, conducted kind of an initial interview with them about their goals for using Twitter and their habits. We showed them the prototype, asked their kind of like initial impressions of it. Um, and in general, we had a couple of main takeaways from these um, initial sessions. Uh, first of all, that like the prototype that we generated was really useful as a success metric, right? Like there are a lot of researchers who really wanted to know whether or not they were reaching sort of like outside the, the researcher bubble. Like maybe they have like a uh, particular research that might be relevant to designers or software engineers, and they want to know whether or not those types of people are seeing their tweets. But um, they also needed more granular insights about their audience, you know, just knowing if like their tweets are reaching non-researchers wasn't yet like helpful enough uh, in order to like frame their work more effectively. And they also needed more guidance on how to use the information that we provide uh, in order to leverage that into more like effective uh, tweets about their research. Uh, so now I'll just talk a little bit about like what we ended up in terms of the final design. Uh, so this first section here uh, basically is an overview of um, our uh, particular users like uh, followers as well as um, their like downstream audience, right? Again, that reached uh, by, by retweets. And we essentially like uh, collated like our different codes into three main categories, which was like researchers, practitioners, which is sort of an umbrella for um, designers and software engineers, and other publics. Uh, and so this like first screen just sort of like gives people an overview of um, like what relative like proportions of these groups exist in their audience and who they're regularly exposed to. Uh, scrolling down, uh, they are then also provided um, with like this visualization, which goes into more detail about like the most common keywords that appeared in uh, the bios from people um, in both like the researcher category, the practitioners category, and the sort of like other publics category. Um, and the idea here is that like beyond just seeing like what like whether or not it's reaching researchers and non-researchers, they could also get a sense of like what specific like subgroups exist in their audience, uh, what they talk about, what their interests are, and kind of like how they self-describe. Uh, we had a few like research back tips, um, just, like pulled uh, from like a few different publications, just to sort of like give them ideas on how they could leverage this information to more successfully frame their research. Uh, you know, things like highlighting the importance or usefulness uh, for the particular audience that they have access to. Um, some more like granular information, like the specific downstream audiences for individual tweets to kind of like use as a success metric. Uh, and finally, we had a couple of sections uh, highlighting like what their audience is talking about. So among like these three different groups, like what are the most common hashtags? as well as what are the most common like tweets among these uh, different groups. Again, to provide a, like, a little bit of more interest of like, what's the conversation? What are people talking about who are in their audience? Uh, and so once we built that, we also ran an evaluation study uh, where we recruited about 25 HCI researchers, uh, kind of snowball samples from Twitter, Slack, and things like that. Uh, again, these were like one hour sessions where we started out by doing like a, a pre-post kind of survey about their habits and confidence um, in terms of like science communication and public scholarship on Twitter. Uh, we asked participants to write an initial tweet about the research before seeing our tool. Uh, we then showed them their data using Ripple, asked you know, how their impression of their audience has changed and how might uh, seeing their data affect their approach to Twitter in the future. And then after seeing their data, they're asked to write a second tweet, uh, given the new insights about their audience to see if their approach changed at all. And so we had a few main findings. Um, 
First, we found that revealing the invisible audience on Twitter um, led to more considerations about the accessibility of their tweeting behavior. So for example, one participant said that, you know, I realized that most of my audience in the general public category and among those audiences, there are a lot of people who are somewhat related to the domain of accessibility and disability. So I've used their language a little bit more specific to that, right? Like realizing like, oh, there's actually this really large audience who's following me on Twitter related to this domain. Let me try and draw them in a little bit more and play up to their interests. So, and we also found that after using Ripple, uh, participants uh, said that they'd be more likely to tweet about their papers in the future, and that they thought tweeting about their papers uh, would be significantly more valuable after having seen like uh, how diverse their audience was. We also found that these audience insights led to kind of like reflecting more about their reach. So for example, another participant said, oh, there's not a lot of privacy peeps. Uh, so I think that maybe I need to be more active in that area, like talking about those so I can reach more people who study that. Right, so it can be the success metric too. Like if you find that you don't have enough people like related to a domain that you care about, um, then maybe you might want to like change the way you approach Twitter and, and try to play to that audience more. And so again, after using Ripple, uh, our participants thought they knew their audience interests better um, and that they felt more capable of, of framing their research after seeing their data. And finally, we also found, uh, although this wasn't one of our like main goals, that revealing who's exposed to one's work can provide uh, some kind of like agency uh, over their Twitter presence. All right. So one person I mentioned, the system kind of gives ac users access to their data in some sense. It lets users view what the data of their audience is actually like. And to me, being able to know that is pretty powerful. I think the system makes it more transparent about, oh, this is your audience. So it lets users make more informed decisions about what to tweet. Right, a couple of our participants found out that like some of their tweets reached audiences that they didn't really want to. Um, you know, uh, certain like political groups, certain religious groups, what have you, uh, and they decided that oh maybe like I want to be more careful about what I tweet in, in the future or rethink doing this kind of like public scholarship at all, having seen like who actually is exposed. So just kind of to wrap up, you know, the invisible audience on Twitter can make science communication and public scholarship really challenging. Uh, but with Ripple, we've shown that uh, we can help researchers understand their reach, help them frame their research to various groups, and help them determine whether to do this kind of work at all. Uh, and so overall, we hope that Ripple can better connect HCI researchers with the broader public. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Um, yeah, so same procedure as before. If you have any questions via chat, please post them. and. While people are typing something in, I would be help, uh, happy to take any questions here from this room. Just hold your hand up. Maybe one question to start people off with is, uh, do you think this can be generalized to other researchers in other communities, not just HCI? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think definitely like the approach we took, um, you know, modeling uh, groups that were like very specific to HCI, uh, could definitely like be applied to to other kind of research fields. I think like the key sort of challenge there is you would need to take a, again like a kind of a grounded approach, and understand what are the important stakeholders for like whatever other fields you're trying to generalize to. Uh, so you can kind of like build predictive models or provide information that that those fields would find more useful than this sort of like designer like software engineer kind of taxonomy that we have going. Yeah, I feel like whenever I talk to Spencer, I learn a lot about how to tweet, and I'm not big on Twitter. Sarah has a question, so I'll come up. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so you classified users, um, Twitter users, based on their, I guess, their bio, which often tend to be really short and sometimes not informative at all. And I'm wondering if you looked into or have any thoughts in using the tweets themselves that the users make to understand better where they're coming from and what they're interested in. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good um, suggestion. So I think like for for our approach, we we, you know, we just use like the the bios, and I think I know there are definitely like some some Twitter modeling papers that have found like using their tweets can be um, like pretty helpful. Um, it actually reminds me of a conversation I had with one of our participants uh, who kind of like brought up you know, not feeling comfortable being classified based on his tweets. Um, so it, it almost gets into like, kind of like an ethical gray space, uh, potentially. Like with, with bios, it's really like a public kind of self-description of who people are. But there are some people I know who are like less comfortable once you start making kind of predictions based on their behavior, like what list they're in, things like that, things that they may have like less control over. So I think like 
if, if I think if I were to take some of that approach, I'd be probably do some kind of like survey or try to do some temperature checking of like how comfortable people are sort of like with that versus just like the bios. But I agree, I think like on a technical level, that would definitely make sense as an approach. Yeah, thank you, Spencer. Um, we should probably, yeah, there's no more questions. Um, we should probably move on to the next talk. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, so let's give him another round. Do you need speaker notes? Yeah, uh, and so the next no. speaker today, and it's, by the way, it's the last speaker too, because Arthur unfortunately is sick, so he couldn't come and present today. But um, um, so we have Rock Pang um, as our last speaker. Rock started his PhD right what in the pandemic, and he's now in his second year. Um, so I believe this might be his first time presenting in front of a live audience. So um, be gentle and nice. <laughs> um, and so Rock has been doing fantastic work on to. trying to um, get people to well. adhere to better scientific practices. In particular, he's been focusing on pre-registration yeah. during his first yeah. project. Um, and he built a tool called Apparatif that he's going to tell you about now. All right. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rock. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting my ongoing work, Aperitif, scaffolding pre registration to automatically generate analysis code and method description. Uh, my talk is going to be divided into three sections. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce you what is pre registration, why we're using it. Second one is why we're scaffolding, as I indicated in my title. The third one is I'm going to walk you through how to use Aperitif and how the kind of design principle that uh, guided Uh The first question is, uh, what is pre-registration? I believe this word might seem unfamiliar to most of you. Uh, pre-registration is a practice of documenting a study's objective analysis plan before observing its outcome. Basically, you can think of it as a timestamp plan that you, uh, a timestamp form that you fill out before data collection. Uh, for example, uh, we have, as predicted, an open science framework. There are two pretty popular mainstream <laughs> pre-registration templates. As you can see, they are just open-ended form that uh, ask researchers to include uh, information such as hypothesis, uh, variables, uh, analysis plan, and how to collect samples. Uh, so uh, then the next question is, like, why we're we using this? Why do we need to fill out this form in the first place, right? So pre-registration really come from this, this framework of NHST, which stands for Null Hypothesis Significance Testing. So what does it really mean? So if I show you this, you'll understand. Uh, basically, uh, in an uh, NHST uh, framework, you typically use this uh, threshold called p-value. If your p-value is uh, less than 0.05, you have a significant result. Uh, if uh, the p-value is greater or equal to 0.05, uh, unfortunately, you have a non-significant result. And this kind of dichotomous thinking creates these all sorts of, sorts of problems, such as publication bias and harking. Publication bias is basically a bias uh, that uh, publication venue tend to publish more papers that report significant results. So BMP uh, less than 0.05. And this creates the researcher, uh, make researchers more likely to kind of manipulate the data uh, after data collection so that they can create this significant uh, result, which then increasing their likelihood of getting their paper published. Uh, Pre-registration was designed as a solution to precisely tackle this problem. Uh, and in addition to ha uh, addressing Harkin, pre-registration is also facilitating uh, teamwork. It also like help researchers to reach a consensus before data collection. Uh, as a matter of fact, in our lab, uh, Katharina kind of required us to do pre-registration for all the experiments, which I think was really helpful. Uh, but however, uh, the pre-registration is still a, a, a pretty new practice in the HCI community. And since it's very new, it naturally brings some questions, uh, which explain why we're doing scaffolding. So. Uh, I'm curious how prevalent is pre-registration of HCI studies? Is the information included in the HCI pre-registration sufficient to comprehend the research study design? Is it consistent, consistent with the papers? Uh, what are motivations and challenges for HCI authors and reviewers? Uh, to answer those questions, we conducted a formative study, the formative studies 
included uh, two analyses. The first analysis is basically a literature analysis of all the CHI conference proceedings in the past four years from 2018 to 2021. Uh, the second is uh, a second analysis is the survey of 11 researchers uh, who have experienced of uh, pre-registration. Uh, the goal of the formative study is to understand what and how researchers are currently pre-registering studies. Uh, so to answer the question I posted, uh, first one is uh, not many people actually pre-registered their study uh, of uh, more than. 2,800 papers, only 80, 38 papers included a total of 47 registrations. That means a paper can include multiple studies. Uh, the, to answer the second question, is the infor information included uh, sufficient to comprehend the study, study design, and is it consistent with the papers? To do that, we report the number of uh, pre-registration with information uh, that are available, comprehensible, and consistent. Uh, being available means is the category provided in the pre-registration. The category means, uh, if you take a look at the x-axis, there are seven, uh, sorry, there are eight different <laughs> categories uh, in the axis, x axis, and we, for each categories, we want to determine whether it's available or comprehensible and consistent. Uh, And as you can see, the, the green bar kind of reports whether the category pre-registered uh, uh, information was available. Not uh, all pre-registration contained those uh, uh, necessary pre-registered information. Uh, and among those, like not all the pre-registration are comprehensible. We, we decide whether a pre-registration was a comprehensible by uh, reaching the, by uh, like, uh, reaching agreement among uh, the authors. Uh, same with consistent consistency. Uh, if you look at the, the, the blue bar, you can see very few pre-registration are actually consistent with the final paper, which makes sense, you know, because pre-registration is uh, such an early stage in your research process, uh, which is very likely to change over the course. Uh, an example of uh, inconsistency, uh, 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 lack of detail, which means incomprehensible, is that uh, this example, like from one of the pre-registration, they said we will test if there is a significant difference in measure it, measurement A between condition A and condition B, which is really not that specific for readers to understand. Uh, to answer the third question, what are motivations and challenges? Uh, we conducted this uh, from the survey with the 11 uh, researchers, including authors and reviewers. Uh, there are some quotes from our survey. Uh, the first one is, pre-registration would help me have a structured plan prior to data collection to limit the excessive flexibility. That's basically the motivation for most authors uh, to decide using pre-registration. Uh, the second is a little bit of challenge by a reviewer. Some pre-registration can have lots of information repeated multiple times and go into too much details about motivation, uh, which the pre-registration isn't really for. The motivation meaning the background information or uh, related work, which isn't really about analysis plan. Uh, third quote is, there was too much freedom with the pre-registration template. This was from one of the research, uh, the author. Uh, here is interesting because from the first quote, we see the motivation for researchers to use pre-registration was really to limit the kind of excessive flexibility. But the current design of the open-ended form gave too much flexibility, uh, which was kind of conflict in between the goal and the actual design. Uh, yeah, another challenge is that if I have enough time to put extra effort to the study planning, I would do so, but sometimes it's not realistically possible. Uh, the last quote, was uh, it helped me to design my study, but it didn't really do much when we changed our plan. Uh, this uh, quote kind of resonates our finding about inconsistency in the literature study. Uh, for, so from our formative study, we come up with a design principles, which uh, scaffolding is a part of it. So we actually have four design principles. Uh, they are scaffolding, uh, the pre-registration to elicit necessary and specific information 
and uh, integrating uh, per registration into the research process and connect it with other research artifacts. That, res that kind of addresses the inconsistency issue we found and tracking the evolution of research plan uh, and reducing the time and cognitive needed to complete the pre-registration. Uh, then we come to the final section of my talk. It's about Aperitif, which is a Chrome extension prototype that overlays the as predicted a platform. Just to remind you, this is what uh, as predicted looks like, which is just a, a form. Uh, to Fulfill the first design goal, we scaffold the pre-registration uh, by adding some more detailed questions. If we look at the lower pictures, we, have, we ask explicitly the researchers what uh, would you, what's the uh, exact independent variable name. Uh, we want users to uh, input like what kind of variable, the variable type and uh, what different categories of, if it's a nominal, what different categories does this variable have? Uh, and then Aperitif will automatically generate this kind of text description uh, below. Uh, this is our example of others. Uh, the, to the analysis, the, the picture above is uh, how user can specify the uh, hypothesis given the input variables. The second design is uh, integrate pre-registration into the research process and connect it with other artifacts. So when you, after you fill out the pre-registration, it will automatically generate uh, the analysis script in Python or R and a kind of a script, uh, a draft of method section that you can reuse when you actually uh, write the paper after data collection. Uh, to do uh, to achieve that, we mainly used T and Touchstone too. T was a, a Python library developed here at UW actually. Uh, thus, to fulfill the third design principle, we basically push all the uh, planning document to GitHub. The last one is reduce the time and cognitive need uh, cognitive load. Uh, cognitive effort needed to complete the pre-registration. We actually have this in mind, we design Aperitif, but we want to evaluate whether we, ha we have achieved this in a user study. Uh, basically, in the user study, the tasks are, we want users to pre-register a study with and without Aperitif. Uh, it's a within subject design. The controlled condition is ab as predicted website, uh, the picture I showed you before. Uh, whereas the experimental condition is Aperitif. We recruited 17 participants uh, with different experience with pre-registration, so we want to capture the feedback from uh, people from different backgrounds. Uh, here are the results. Uh, we found uh, participants pre-register six minutes faster with Aperitif compared uh, with uh, as, predicted, as predicted template itself. Uh, here are some uh, survey feedback. Uh, in general, uh, participants are pretty satisfied with using Aperitif to pre-register. Cool, that concludes my talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Rock. Um, and you can probably also all see the loop back to Tal's work where you know, the automatic method section generation is still a little bit rough with those NLP methods, and Tal is working on fixing that, maybe. Um, new task. <laughs> but yeah, again, if anybody has any questions, we have maybe two minutes left. Um, let us know, and I'll also try to see whether there's anything in the chat. I think Tal has a question. Thank you. Great talk, Rock. Um, so you, one of the participant quotes uh, that had stuck with, with me was like kind of how difficult it is to make a pre-registration flexible to like a changing plan of a research study. Um, and I know that like some of the design of a pre-registration is almost not to allow that too much, um, but to maybe allow that a little bit. And I was curious, you mentioned that uh, to kind of provide that flexibility uh, aperitif can, like pushes everything to GitHub. Was there any, was that, 
part of the user evaluation at all, or did any users have feedback on like that being a useful way for them to be able to kind of track research project progress and be able to flex a pre-registration design? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We actually didn't test uh, the consi how Aperitif solved the consistency issue in the user evaluation because that involves kind of a longitudinal study of how user would perceive over the course of the research. Uh, but certainly it's interesting to compare kind of using GitHub to track and other uh, version control system. Uh, I believe there, are, I haven't looked into too much about the recent work, but I believe there is a lot of different uh, version control system. Uh, yeah, it's, it would be interesting to compare. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I believe two questions in the chat. One is from Alan Borning. Um, did you pre-register your own user study for the project? Uh, yes, we absolutely Meta. did. We actually analyzed our data with the artifact generated by Aperitif. And the next question is materiously from Mentor Microsoft. <laughs> Don't know what that means. Is the scaffolding only used for the write-ups or does it write some basic code that includes the necessary infrastructure to collect the corresponding telemetry? What does, sorry, what does telemetric mean? I am not entirely sure. I, if I, I might be able to. Yeah, maybe you. My, so Mentor Microsoft can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think that's like, so it, it seems like the Aperitif de generates the code for analysis. Is there also any ability to have Aperitif generate code for collection? So if you had a particular application in mind, it could generate uh, the, to like, the data to collect, or so, sorry, the analysis to collect the data. Yeah, if I yeah. understand right, does it like automatically generate like an online survey for you? Yeah. Uh, or other. Or other, or other uh, uh, whatever, yeah. data collection. Uh, uh, mm, for the current design, no. But uh, in the discussion section of our paper, we talked about how we can extend Aperitif to include uh, something like that. Yeah, especially for qualitative study, uh, which doesn't really, maybe doesn't really involve like a controlled experiment. Uh, it would be cool to automatically generate like, for example, interview scripts or survey, uh, kind of de survey deployment on um, MTurk, for example. Yeah, and um, Andres and others who are inter interested in this question, I'll, I'll defer you to Rene, because Rene has lots of ideas about this. <laughs> Um, the kind of automation of the whole experiment pipeline and so on. Um, but yeah, thank you again, Rock, and maybe we can give him a round of applause and a round of applause for all of the speakers today. Um, and with that, that's our Wild Lab Colloquium today. We do lots of other work, so if you ever want to talk to any of us, please do so. Um, we are always happy to chat about research, so um, reach out to us. And thanks all for coming, and thanks to those of you on Zoom. <laughs>